The approach and landing phases are statistically the most dangerous flight segments. In fact, the final approach and landing phases account for over 40% of all accidents, despite being only 4% of total flight time. Of these accidents, most occur on center line within 10 nautical miles of the runway. The purpose of this section is to present the risks and factors that account for these accidents. By increasing your knowledge of these risks, you will be able to make more informed decisions and enhance the safety of your flight. In today's multi-crew, highly automated flight deck, effective crew coordination and crew resource management are critical to the success of the flight. Your company uses CRM as a building block for their standard operating procedures, or SOPs. These procedures are the backbone of a safe operation. Adhering to these standard operating procedures during an approach results in improved situational awareness and aircraft control. The procedures promote teamwork, with each person understanding their role and anticipating how the other crew member will react. A breakdown in crew coordination may result in deviations from standard operating procedures, increasing the likelihood of an accident. These breakdowns may occur for several reasons. Deviating from the typical pilot flying, pilot not flying task sharing, for example the pilot flying attempting to program the FMS during a critical phase of flight inadequately briefing the expected approach, monitoring errors such as failing to monitor the instruments while performing FMS entries, being behind the airplane, incorrect use of automation, omitting part or all of a normal checklist, deliberate or inadvertent non-adherence to procedures including standard callouts or excessive deviation callouts, or failing to execute a go-around when necessary. In addition to following standard operating procedures, following these golden rules can reduce the risk of an approach and landing accident, particularly when faced with an abnormal situation. Aviate, navigate, communicate, and manage. In the event of an abnormal procedure, this guidance can help the crew accomplish and prioritize the required tasks. In modern aircraft, the automation shifts the pilot's duties from flying the aircraft to managing the aircraft. Focusing on management tasks can result in a loss of situational awareness or an incorrect response to an abnormal situation. The first priority should always be for the pilot flying to stabilize the aircraft and continue flying. The pilot not flying should back up the pilot flying until the aircraft is stabilized. Once the airplane is under control, select or restore the desired mode for lateral and vertical navigation keeping in mind the terrain and minimum safe altitude. After the aircraft's flight path is stable, ATC should be informed of the abnormal or emergency condition. Advise them of your intentions and ask for any assistance required. The next priority is to manage the aircraft's systems and conduct the appropriate abnormal or emergency procedure. Take the time to understand the condition or situation before acting. Incorrect decisions are frequently the result of an incorrect identification of the problem. Take the time to assess the situation by requesting radar vectors or a holding pattern. Use all of your available resources to evaluate all of the available options. Once a decision is made on how to proceed, manage your workload by dividing the pilot flying and pilot not flying tasks and use the automation to alleviate workload.
The auto flight system can be a valuable tool in reducing workload and increasing the amount of time available to respond to an abnormal situation. The autopilot should be used during descent and approach, particularly when operating in marginal weather or at an unfamiliar airport. During a go-around or missed approach, the auto flight system can be a valuable aid, especially when the missed approach procedure is included in the FMS flight plan. Use the following three steps to ensure the auto flight system is used safely and efficiently. Understand the system operation and what the result of any action will be. Perform the action on the control panel or the FMS CDU. Cross-check the armed modes, selected modes, and entries on the FMA, the PFD, ND, and the FMS CDU. If the aircraft does not follow the desired or planned flight path, disconnect the autopilot and hand-fly the aircraft. Do not try to reprogram any of the automation until the aircraft is under control. Now that we've discussed some basic procedures, let's move to a point just prior to arrival. This is a good time to make sure both you and the airplane are ready for the arrival. The first step in preparing for an approach is to make an effective approach briefing. This briefing should always be conducted regardless of familiarity with the destination airport. An approach briefing is a good time to create a common mental image of how the approach will be performed. The briefing should involve both crew members in an interactive dialogue, providing an opportunity to raise questions on the planned procedure. Briefings should also avoid routine repetition of the same information on each flight. Highlighting the special aspects of the approach or actual weather conditions will result in a more effective briefing. Start the briefing in a timely manner, approximately 10 minutes prior to reaching the top of descent point. This will reduce the likelihood of making mistakes as a result of time constraints. Let's look at an example of an approach briefing and discuss what items should be included. In this example, you are en route to the Denver airport. Once the ATIS is received, the crew has a good idea of what to expect on arrival and can start the briefing. According to the ATIS, you can expect the ILS for runway 7 in Denver. As a guideline, chart briefing should follow the flow of a normal approach, safe altitudes, nav radio setup, approach requirements, lighting, and missed approach. Here is an example of a typical approach chart brief, also called a plate brief. We'll plan on the ILS to runway 7 in Denver, dated 19th of November to the 17th of December. The MSA in all sectors is 9,200 feet, based off the Denver VOR. And arriving from the southwest, we have one obstacle at 6,855 feet. The airport elevation is 5,431 feet. We'll plan on radar vectors to join the final approach course. Localizer frequency is 111.55 with a course of 079 degrees. If vectors are out far enough, once established on the course and cleared for the approach, we have to cross Sarah at 9,000 and Taylor at about 7,000. We'll need to be stabilized before descending below 6,431 feet. The decision altitude is 5,548 feet and we need 1,800 RVR to complete the approach. Currently we have a visibility of one mile. If we have to go missed approach, I'll plan on climbing to 5,900 feet, and then a climbing right turn to 10,000 feet, intercept the 078 degree radial off the Falcon VOR to Limex intersection and hold as published. The missed approach is in the FMS, so I'll plan on using lateral navigation. If we do have to go missed, we'll plan on diverting to Colorado Springs. An airport chart brief provides both crew members with a clear plan of what to expect after landing. This is especially important at large airports where there can be a large workload once on the ground. Runway 7 has Malzer lighting and is 12,000 feet long. We plan to turn left to Bravo 4 and taxi to the ramp via Gulf. Remember, this is just a sample of items to include in your approach briefing. Each briefing should be customized to be relevant to the unique aspects of the approach and surrounding terrain.
We'll now discuss the principles of a stabilized approach. A stabilized approach can significantly reduce the likelihood of an accident during an approach and landing. Preparation is the key. Although unstable approaches can be caused by a variety of factors, they are usually the result of insufficient time to plan, prepare, and conduct a stabilized approach. In the first module, we briefly described the concept of a stabilized approach. Now let's expand that definition with some specifics. First, the approach must be stabilized by 1,000 feet above the airport elevation in instrument conditions or visual conditions. The aircraft is considered stable when the following criteria are met. The aircraft is on the correct flight path, and only small changes in heading and pitch are required to maintain the flight path. The aircraft speed is not more than VREF plus 20 or less than VREF. The aircraft is in the landing configuration. Sink rate is no greater than 1,000 feet per minute. The power setting is appropriate for the aircraft's configuration. And all briefings and checklists have been conducted. In addition, the aircraft localizer and glide slope must be within one dot on a CAT 1 ILS. Or within the expanded localizer band on a CAT 2 or CAT 3 ILS. If conditions necessitate a deviation from these standards, they should be discussed in a special briefing. Also, if the approach becomes unstable below the stabilization altitude, an immediate go around should be executed. Here are some guidelines to avoid an unstable approach. Anticipate the factors likely to result in an unstable approach. Detect when a limit is about to be exceeded. Take corrective action before a deviation occurs. And decide if an approach is unstable before reaching the minimum stabilization height. An unstable approach is often caused by mismanagement of the aircraft's energy condition. An incorrect energy condition may result in an accident due to loss of control, landing before reaching the runway, a hard landing, a tail strike, or a runway overrun. It's common in high density airports to receive an ATC clearance to maintain a high airspeed to the outer marker. So, how long does it take to decelerate from the assigned speed to your approach speed? That answer depends on your aircraft type, gross weight, and other factors. Here are some typical values you can use as a reference. In level flight with approach flaps extended, the airplane will decelerate approximately 10 to 15 knots per nautical mile. Extending the landing gear and landing flaps increases the deceleration rate to 20 to 30 knots per nautical mile. With approach flaps and landing gear down, the airplane will decelerate approximately 10 to 20 knots per nautical mile while on the glide path. Decelerating on a three degree glide path can be significantly more difficult without additional drag. Using speed brakes will achieve a faster rate of deceleration, but should not be used below 1,000 feet above the airport elevation. On the other end of the spectrum, an unstable approach can result from allowing the aircraft to slow at an unsafe speed. This is known as operating on the backside of the power curve. On the backside of the power curve, the aircraft will continue to decelerate at a given power setting. The final approach speed is typically on the backside of the power curve. Below this speed, additional thrust will be required. This presents a problem during landing and can increase the risks of a hard landing or tail strike. If at any time during the approach the amount of thrust is excessive or the aircraft is too slow, a go around should be initiated. Non precision approaches present a particular challenge when it comes to stabilized approaches and sea fit risk. Non precision approaches lack a vertical guidance component and are rarely encountered. As pilots may be less familiar with these approaches, there are some techniques to reduce the likelihood of an accident. 
One technique is to fly a constant angle descent. This allows the flight crew to fly from the final approach fix to the visual descent point using a specific angle. Traditionally, non-precision approaches have been flown using step-downs based on obstacle clearance altitudes. These approaches typically require a high workload with multiple level offs and large power changes. By using a constant angle approach, the aircraft can be flown using a constant vertical speed and aircraft power setting. Flying a constant angle descent can be accomplished in several ways. Many modern aircraft are equipped with vertical navigation or VNAV. In a VNAV approach, the aircraft can automatically begin a constant angle descent at the final approach fix. While there are some differences, a VNAV approach is not unlike an ILS. In both cases, the aircraft captures and follows a glide path to a decision altitude where the decision is made to land or execute a missed approach. If VNAV is not available, a vertical speed can be flown that approximates the glide path angle for the approach. Some approach charts and publications contain a chart of vertical speeds that will produce a specific glide path based on ground speed. If no vertical speeds are published, formulas can be used to deduce when to start the descent as well as what vertical speed to use. Some aircraft are also equipped with a flight path vector. The flight path vector can be used to fly a precise constant angle descent during the approach. In this example, the airplane is flying a 3 degree approach by setting a flight path vector of minus 3 degrees. When flying a constant angle descent, the aircraft may or may not be authorized to descend to the MDA before a missed approach is executed. If descent below the MDA is not authorized, the crew must use a derived decision altitude, or DDA, as the missed approach point. The derived decision altitude is figured by adding 50 feet to the MDA. This creates a 50-foot buffer prior to a missed approach climb. Consult your operations manual for specific information and procedures for non-precision approaches. We've discussed some techniques that can be used to reduce the risk of an accident during approach and landing. Now let's look at some hazards associated with approach and landing procedures. These include visual illusions, wind shear, runway excursions, and runway overruns. Visual illusions are the result of an absence or alteration of the visual reference. Illusions can modify the pilot's perception of their position relative to the runway threshold. The lack of position reference may lead the flight crew to make incorrect flight control inputs. These illusions are most prevalent when transitioning from IMC to VMC. A black hole effect can occur during a night approach to an airport surrounded by unlit terrain or water. This effect can be exacerbated by a lack of visual approach guidance, horizon reference, moonlight, or other peripheral cues. This illusion causes a false perception of being too high on the approach, causing the flying pilot to pitch down to compensate. Runways that are wide, short, or feature a downhill slope may result in the perception of being too low on the approach. The opposite is also true. On a narrow or long runway or a runway with an uphill slope, the crew may perceive their path as being too high. Approach and runway lighting can also play a factor in depth perception. Bright lights tend to create the illusion that the runway is closer than it really is. Low-intensity lights create the impression of being farther away from the runway.
Visual illusions can be created by certain weather conditions. Flying in light rain, fog, or haze tends to create the illusion of being too high. This results in the pilot pushing the airplane down and possibly landing short of the runway. Entering a layer of shallow fog creates the perception of pitching up. This may also cause the pilot to pitch down, increasing the risk of landing short of the runway. When preparing for an approach, be aware of the conditions that may cause visual illusions. Maintain an instrument scan until touchdown. Use an ILS approach whenever available. Use a VASI or PAPI down to the runway threshold. Use other tools such as DME or an extended runway centerline from the FMS to confirm your position relative to the runway. Wind shear can be defined as a sudden change of wind velocity and or directions. Wind shear poses a direct risk to the safety of flight, particularly during the slow speed and low altitude conditions of an approach. There are two types of wind shear. Vertical wind shear is a sudden change in wind speed or direction during a climb or descent. Horizontal wind shear is a horizontal change in the wind component, for example, a decreasing headwind affecting the aircraft on approach. The safest and best wind shear strategy is avoidance. Many airports utilize low-level wind shear alert systems, known as LWAS, which alert controllers of wind shear conditions. LWAS consists of a central wind sensor and peripheral wind sensors located on the airport. If a difference between sensors in excess of 15 knots is detected, an alert is generated. The next generation of warning systems incorporates Terminal Doppler Weather Radar, or TDWR. TDWR features a fine-resolution radar plot that allows controllers to detect wind shear beyond the airport boundary. This system can then detect wind shear that poses a hazard to aircraft on the entire approach corridor, not just on the airport. Pilot reports can be both useful and misleading. However, wind shear conditions can change rapidly, and these reports should be weighted accordingly. Any report of airspeed fluctuations in excess of 20 knots or vertical speed changes in excess of 500 feet per minute below 1,000 feet should be cause for caution. Visual observations of blowing dust, rings of dust, or dust devils can be a sign of existing wind shear. The following onboard indications can also provide the flight crew with important wind shear information. Wind direction and speed, ground speed, weather radar, wind shear warning, and predictive wind shear warning. It is important to know the signs of wind shear. They include Indicated airspeed variations in excess of 15 knots. Ground speed variation, in particular a decreasing headwind or increasing tailwind. Vertical speed excursions exceeding 500 feet per minute. Pitch attitude excursions of 5 degrees or more. Glide slope deviations of 1 dot or more. Heading variations of 10 degrees or more or any unusual auto-throttle activity or throttle lever position. If wind shear is encountered during approach or landing, the wind shear escape maneuver should be performed immediately. While this maneuver can vary between airplanes and operators, it typically involves selecting toga power and pitching up to the target attitude. Continue to climb without changing the flap or landing gear configuration with the wings level. Allow the airspeed to decrease all the way to stick shaker while monitoring airspeed trend. A runway excursion is an incident when an aircraft unintentionally veers off the runway during a landing roll or taxi. Weather and pilot error are two common factors contributing to runway excursions. 
The following weather-related factors can contribute to a potential excursion. Runway conditions such as wet or standing water contamination, snow, slush, or ice. Wind shear or a large crosswind component. Inaccurate information on wind or runway conditions. And selection of reverse thrust combined with a crosswind or wet runway. On aircraft with aft-mounted engines, controllability issues may be further aggravated by adding reverse thrust. Selecting reverse thrust reduces the airflow over the aircraft's vertical stabilizer, reducing its effectiveness. Runway excursions may also be the result of flight crew technique and decision-making skills. Common errors leading to excursions include incorrect crosswind landing technique, inappropriate use of differential braking, incorrect use of the nose wheel steering tiller at high airspeeds, and trying to exit the runway at high speed. Runway overruns occur when the aircraft fails to stop on the available runway. Factors that can cause an overrun include weather, performance, landing technique, and decision-making errors. Weather and field conditions can change rapidly, sometimes in a matter of a few minutes. When conditions become worse than expected, the landing performance is invalidated. If these changes go unnoticed by the crew or if new performance is not calculated, the risk of an overrun is greatly increased. Conditions that may invalidate landing performance include runway condition and braking action, surface winds, and wind shear or tailwinds. Landing performance calculations can be complicated with many variables to consider. This task becomes both more difficult and more important when coupled with bad weather, inoperative aircraft equipment, inoperative airport equipment, or a complicated airport. Inoperative aircraft components that may affect landing performance include thrust reversers, anti-skid, auto brakes, spoilers. The margin of safety for landing performance can be small and it is therefore extremely important to ensure the performance calculations are as accurate as possible. If uncertainty exists regarding performance figures, the crew should obtain assistance from dispatch if possible. Pilot technique and decision-making also plays a part in runway overruns. For example, an unstable approach or a failure to perform a necessary go-around can lead to an accident. Extending the flare can cause the airplane to float down the runway. Failing to arm the ground spoilers or failure to detect that the ground spoilers did not extend can cause the aircraft to decelerate at an inadequate rate. Additionally, power-on touchdowns can prevent the ground spoilers from extending. Bouncing the aircraft or applying the brakes late in the landing roll can also lead to a runway overrun. There are a number of precautions crews can take to decrease the likelihood of an overrun. Adhere to the SOPs and fly a stable approach. Understand the effects that a crosswind has on aircraft controllability. Be alert for the factors that are conducive to wind shear. Understand how environmental conditions affect landing distance. And don't hesitate to go around if at any point the outcome is uncertain. Note how the following factors affect landing distance. Weight. Runway condition. Pressure altitude. Tailwind. Thrust reversers. And excess airspeed.